Thank you for checking out the Performance Anxiety Podcast on the Pantheon Podcast Network. I am your host, Mark, and I am joined by two-thirds of the band Sweet Justice today. Frank Meyer and Bruce Duff regale me with some amazing stories, like the time Bruce just winged a kiss solo for the band Red Cross. There's also the time that Frank announced to the band that they got a record deal after playing a show of mostly covers. One of my favorites, though, is how they got Cherie Curry to play Cherry Bomb with them during their third show ever. They've released their new EP, Redline, after a 17-year gap, and it rocks. In fact, I like it even more than their debut. So give them a follow at SweetJustice underscore music. Buy the EP wherever you get your music. Follow us at Performance ANX. And get some merch at performanceanx.threadless.com or send some coffee our way at ko-fi.com slash performanceanxiety. Now let's dish out some sweet justice with Frank Meyer and Bruce Duff on Performance Anxiety, a proud member of Pantheon Podcast Network. Hey, I'm Frank Meyer. And I'm Bruce Duff. And we and we're are here ba- on Performance oh, Anxiety. Hold on, wait, 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 wait. Sorry, we'll do one oh, you more. Want me to- Fabulous. Take two, coming at you. Hey, I'm Frank Meyer. And I'm Bruce Duff. And we are the band Sweet Justice. And you can hear our new album, Redline, on Performance Anxiety. It's coming out on Eternal Music Group. And you can catch us on Instagram at Sweet Justice underscore music. See ya. All righty. All right. And Frank is coming on here. Let me let him in. Let me get, let me get a good position here so it looks... <laughs> Fancy back here. Is that, is that like too much? No, no. It's this is. I just record the audio. So, oh, so, I I put on a shirt for nothing. Uh, well, you take it off. Trousers on and the whole bit. <laughs> hey, guys. Right. hey, what's up, man? Oh, nice. I like your dog. Yeah, that's Mojo. Hey, Mojo. <laughs> hey, Mo. Come here, Mo. Tends to have the most intelligent answers. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, they made Mojo's. He's the real spokesperson of the band. He may have better questions than me, too. We'll find out. Yeah, we'll find out. Hey, so just so I caught it. So the video is just for your reference. We don't need I don't need to worry about it if I'm uh, picking my nose or whatever. Do whatever you want, man. Fabulous. Great. Bruce is already talking about taking his shirt off. So, well, well, have you seen it here? Have you seen Bruce's physique? My God. I mean, if I looked like that, I would be taking my shirt off every day. He's, he's like a young Lee major. Oh, know? wow. Yeah. Oh, well, thank you guys so much for coming on. I really appreciate this. This is great. You got it, Matt. Cool. Now, we have, now we're just free to talk about you guys. Oh, thank God. Here we go. Now it's going to get really loose. All right. So... Definitely want to discuss the new album because I think it's awesome. And I've been listening to it for a little while now. But before we get into that, I want to find out kind of how we, you guys got to this point. So I want to little, learn a little bit more about how you got into music in the first place. So Frank, what got you into music in the first place? Were you, was there a lot of it in the house growing up or was it a rebellious thing? How did you get into music and was guitar your first instrument? I grew up in Los Angeles in the eighties and my parents were definitely music fans. My stepdad was an entertainment lawyer and he was in the music industry. So there was always definitely lots of music, but he also took us to a lot of concerts when we were kids. And because he worked in the music industry, occasionally we would go to, you know, like backstage at these things. And I think as a little impressionable youth, seeing that there was this sort of production behind the shows and then seeing like these big stars who were on stage standing backstage looking a lot more human. Um, I didn't realize it at the time, but I think that had a big influence on me. And my brother uh, is also a musician, but he's more known as an actor. And both of us went into show business. And I think a lot of it has to do, and we went in as at a young age. And I think uh, it had a lot to do with not only that exposure, but that exposure of the behind the scenes thing. But to specifically answer your question, for me, when I was a kid, I always loved music and I loved rock and roll. And I always loved things like, I loved the, you know, Grease and the Muppet Show and all these things that had music in them, even though I didn't necessarily understand why I was drawn to it. Mm -hmm. But for me, it was Joan Jett, 
and the Go-Go's. And it's funny because later on, I was sort of aware, you know, when I was a musician, that there was this sort of thing where like, oh, like some men think girls can't rock and, you know, or like girls aren't as good. But when I was a kid, the whole reason why I got really inspired by music was Joan Jett, the Go-Go's, and even maybe Tony Basil, you know, oh, oh Mickey. Uh, Mickey, um, you're so fun, you know, yeah. Yeah, like, oh, Mickey and my Sharona probably got me, like, addicted to the radio. <laughs> but it was it was the first Go-Go's record and the first Joan Jett record, and then I Love Rock and Roll, that really made me, like, obsessed with rock. Like, obsessed. You know, like, this is something that's important to me now. And then I heard... Um, and I'll never forget it. I was listening to Van, uh, to KLOS in the middle of the night on a Sunday night, and they played the new Van Halen single. It was Pretty Woman. It was their cover, and it was the first Van Halen I had. I might have heard You Really Got Me before that, but like the first song that blew my mind is I heard Pretty Woman, and it's not even by any means now as you know as an adult, it's not even my favorite Van Halen song, right. nor did they write it. But it was the first time I heard Eddie's guitar coming out of the radio, and it literally was a life-changing thing where I just went, I need to play guitar, I need to study this, and need and I and I was a baseball player, I was in track, I was in, you know, I was a sports kid, and and then I just never cared about anything else until girls. Uh, than guitar for me it was it was Joan Jett and the Go-Go's and then it was Eddie Van Halen and later I got into punk rock and the Stooges and the Ramones and all that more, much more credible stuff but you know when you're a kid you're not worried about like credibility you just no. know like what, what makes your heart pump fast you know it's funny you mentioned those two tracks because those two tracks actually made a huge impression on me the Joan Jett and the Van Halen because I went out one day with my mom and she's like oh let's go to get your record what is it? What do you want? So I, I looked at one and it was a KTEL compilation and it had Joan Jett's I Love Rock and Roll and it had Pretty Woman by Van Halen on it. It also had the uh, Hall and Oates and dude. Genesis. But, oh, those are, you, you, that's my jam. That's my year, yeah. baby. <laughs> you're, you're in my head. Yeah, it had Abba Cab on it and uh, it had Huey Lewis in the news. It was just, it's a really awesome, actually an awesome comp. But, but those Bruce, two Bruce. songs. But Bruce is, you know, Bruce is like a few years older than me and that like oh, Bruce uh, and I'm wild <laughs> guessing saw like the runaways, you know, Bruce was doing the Starwood scene and he, I don't know if he saw Van Halen and Joan Jett when they were teens or whatever, but I know you did see the runaways, right? Uh, yeah, I saw him at the, it was a weird show. I saw him at the Roxy. We drove, I lived in Riverside. That's where I grew up. We drove in, I was in college. And we drove in, four of us, and saw the Runaways. And it was funny because we had seats and everything. It was kind of amazing when I think back on it. Did they headline or were they opening? They headlined, but as they were getting ready to go on, some, some guy comes out and goes, hey, we got a special treat for you right now. Here's Rick Derringer and his full the full-on four-piece Rick Derringer band. Oh, wow. And now played a whole set and they were killer. And then the runaways came out and they were killer. I saw them again later in Riverside at a bigger place. Uh, but by was, then uh, Joan was the lead singer. I was going to say, yeah. so when you, when you first saw him, was Sheree the singer? Yeah. It was the, it was like first album was just out. They were wow. toasting Dude, the I, I have to tell you that, man, Joan, you know, Joan was a big influence. I mean, I wouldn't even say big. Jo jo I mean, Joan Jett is absolutely, I've said this before. Joan Jett is the reason why I play music. Like I love Eddie Van Halen and I love the Ramones. I've written books on the Ramones. Obviously my band is my, the street walking cheetahs. My band outside of sweet justice is named, uh, after, you know, a Stooges song, but yeah. like Jett is the reason why I play music. She was so cool that it literally made me stop every single other thing in my life, except for wanting to be basically be Joan Jett. I, I just wanted to be Joan Jett. Yeah. And, and so, but, but for me, I missed the runaways cause that was a little ahead of my time. Like yeah. when I started stone, it was early Joan Jett solo and I was a young teen, but the runaways to me, I think that band was the greatest thing since sliced bread. Just like, wow. I mean, well, they like, were, you know, people go, they're a good band for girls. I go, no, they're a good, good. band. Yeah. They're, a they're great good. band. Yeah. I was on team Lita. I was really impressed with well, so, <laughs> so, so here's sort of a runaways connection though, that, that threads throughout both Bruce and I's music careers, which is so me, Bruce and Dino Everett from the street walking cheetahs. We're all like diehard runaways fans from different generations and stuff. 
And uh, when Dino and I were first friends, we went to a really early Cherie Curry show at, uh, at the coconut teaser. And we went up to her afterwards and we were like, Oh my God, Cherie, we love you so much. You're our hero. We love you so much. And we had her sign our runaways records. And we told her we started this band called the street walk and cheetahs and we're named after a studio song. But actually the first song we ever played at rehearsal was cherry bomb by the runaways. And we're playing here on Saturday night at the coconut teaser. If you would possibly return here and, and grace us with your presence. And I swear to God, and we were, nobody at this time she went sure i'll see you friday night and she came Whoa. and at, at like our third gig we ever did <laughs> sheree got on stage with us and sang cherry bomb oh. and like when i tell you that like we were a band doing all punk rock cover tunes to like 14 people and then at our third gig sheree curry sang cherry bomb with us and by our fourth gig we were like a top punk rock cover band doing to a packed house Man. And, then by our, and then by our fifth gig greg shaw from bump Records saw us and said hey guys these songs you're playing are terrific and i went well under my breath i went well yeah like they're all covers mostly by bands <laughs> that you put out on your label and he went this is great if you got more songs like this we could do a record and i went sure and he goes you're signed and i went back to the <laughs> band and i said guys the good news is we just got signed to bump records uh, the bad news is we've got to write a whole album's worth of songs that sound like the runaways and the dead boys <laughs> invaders and the stooges and all the bands that greg shaw himself has put out because somehow he didn't realize we were playing fucking covers tonight so you know known. no i mean i don't know i know greg really well and i'm telling you like i brought him to that show and like it, we were doing you know granted we were doing like black to calm and some you know some obscure songs but like we did cherry bomb and you know we weren't exactly do hiding our hand like we were pretty obvious <laughs> about it and he literally came up to me and he goes man these songs are great and i went yeah like obviously <laughs> they're cut mostly i mean we, we, Aren't we, they, we, were doing, we were doing a few originals i think none of your business which is off the first cheetahs record that was in the set there was a few others But he was like, you got more songs like this. And I said, yeah. And he went, cool, then let's do a record. And then I ran back and told the band, we got to write an album's worth of incredible songs. <laughs> and that's our first, and, and in a weird way, it's sort of, and literally, he, Bruce, just to remind you, he asked one question and we're like 15, I'm David Lee Roth in this shit, <laughs> you know, 15 minutes. In. But to answer your original question, literally that's sort of what set us on our way is that like we were doing all these covers and then we got signed and we realized, well, we need to sound like all these bands that we're yeah. covering because that's sort of what people are digging about us. So that's why we sort of sound the way we do that. Cheap Trick meets MC5 meets Dead Boys meets The Runaways meets Stooges thing. Yeah. Oh, well, I mean, you, I asked one question, but you've answered like five that I had written down. So that, that's right. okay. Pre economical like that. Exactly. And all that, by the way, that was just the story of how the Streetwalk and Cheetahs formed which actually, now that I really think about it, has nothing to do with your original question because you were asking about Sweet Chocolate. <laughs> and Bruce and I also, so Bruce and I play in the Street Walk and Cheetahs, but we also play in Sweet Justice. And Sweet Justice is sort of this blues rock side project, except really it wasn't even a side project. It really was like an organic band that Bruce and I formed. It's sort of like a blues rock take on what we do as opposed to the cheetahs are more like a sleazy glam punk take. Right. right. Yeah. It's a lot more well, pared down. We both, we were, I was playing in the ads adolescence and he was, had the cheetahs. We were both on the same label. Both bands kind of felt like they were winding down and we were, so we were hanging out and we, I remember we went to this show uh, to see cool Keith. Oh, nice. Genre. And we were watching cool Keith and we're like kind of chatting around and, 
Frank goes, yeah, I got cakewalk and I'm making hip hop beats and all this kind of stuff. I go, oh, well, I have this four track sampler and I'm making like electro, you know, fat boy slim type beats. And like, Let's get together and make beats and see it. So we just started doing hip hop of all things. Man. And then we got this opportunity to do this kind of blues rocky thing for a film. And that was sort of the birth of Sweet Justice. And by then, both the Cheetahs and the ads are still going. But, you know, when a band kind of is just sort of running on autopilot, we yeah. started wanting to do something a little different. And we sort of consciously said, let's not do straight up punk rock. Let's do something a little broader. And so we did. So, Bruce, how did you get into music in the first place? Because you've been in. My story is different. So yeah. I'm of the age when I think Frank had to go for a sec. I'm of the age when everybody my age will say, I saw the Beatles on Ed Sullivan. Okay. I'm actually saw the Beatles before that in England, staying with my grandparents when I was seven. And I, I wow. wanted to go to castles and pretend I was Dracula. I was not <laughs> interested in the Beatles. You know, <laughs> this is true. And when we left to come back to L.A., I happened to be at Heathrow when there was a Beatles riot, when they returned from Germany. <laughs> I was scared. I wasn't like, oh, I want to be in a rock band. I was like, I want to get home to Riverside where stuff is normal. Yeah. So it wasn't a thing to me at all. For me, I got into music through records. I got really interested as with record players as a toy and had my own record player and was getting like little kid records and crap like that when I was like seven, okay. you know, and I didn't really get into music till later when I, I just had a, you know, a transistor radio surgically implanted in my head, <laughs> started to smell the top 40 rock and roll. And then it was really a, a kid in my, that in school that I was friends with had us over one day and he was like, Hey, look, and he brought out this electric guitar and an amp and started playing. He was, it was his 10th birthday and he sat down and he was doing bar chords and he, he looked like a professional musician. I was Whoa. like, how did you learn this? Where did this come from? He said, well, I've been taking lessons and by, and he, he goes, do you, are you, and I think in a way he was like showing all his friends what he was up to, to see if anyone wanted to play. Ah. And I was, I was that guy. So okay. he introduced me his guitar teacher and then I got a guitar and we started working together and learning together. And it was so far back in time and so removed from like any kind of thing you could see in live, we were kind of learning what was going on by seeing local bands play at junior high school things, you know, and just standing in front of them. How, well, what are they doing? How do they set up? You know, just yeah. that's how we figured it out. So that's really where I came from. And, you know, just band after band, you'd learn this band and then that would get to be old. And then you'd go on to the next and learning covers and eventually figuring out how to write a song, you know, that <laughs> kind of thing, but junior high through high school. And then by, time i was in college i joined an original band and we started writing songs and we went from there so is that when you wanted to or when you maybe thought you could do music as a living yeah i guess so i mean i i took uh composition in school and okay. so i was taking it pretty seriously and continuing to study and uh yeah and then my band in college evolved into this thing called numbers and we were sort of like the tubes, if you will, of Riverside. It was like 76 through 78. Okay. We had a big show. We had dancers. We had lights. We had smoke machines. We blew stuff up. We had costumes. <laughs> and there, our songs were like little stories, like wow. the tubes. You know, we started playing all the LA, driving in with a bus full of our fans to play the Troubadour and playing the Starwood and playing the whiskey and the labels would all come to see us. And hey, you, know, Bruce, you say is, too expensive and too, uh, no hits. Yeah. Is this the band, was Numbers the band that was on the gong show? We didn't call ourselves that, but yes, it was the main players from, the Numbers were a pretty big band. Okay. But in terms of membership, but uh, yeah, we, five of, Four of us went on the gong show and played. Really? Twice. Wow. Yeah. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsors. I want to take a minute and talk about our sponsor, Tiesta Tea. Tiesta is a tea company on a mission to create loose leaf tea beverages with premium ingredients that taste good and do good. Each tea is blended for one of five categories so you can energize, Slender eyes, boost antioxidants, boost immunity, and relax. My current favorite is Blueberry Wild Chow. You know, when I was growing up, my dad always told me, once you go loose, you never go bagged. 
And you know what? He was right. Go to tiestat.com and use the promo code ANXIETY15 at checkout to get 15% off your order. Think you know T? You haven't tried Tiesta T. Hilarious. A uh, <laughs> little, little rock and roll trivia. Uh, we played, and then we got, you guys are good. You're going to come back and do the nighttime show. The nighttime show, they filmed a bunch of them at once. And uh, so there was a bunch of people all in this room getting ready to go. Among them was another weirdo band, a sister, which was Blackie Lawless's band at the time. And, uh, and his, oh, yeah. This was before he like did all the blowing up stuff and lighting himself on fire. Their gimmick <laughs> was more low budget. <laughs> Are you ready? Their gimmick was they ate worms. Live worms. Oh. <laughs> hey, so are you <laughs> saying? My thought. Are you saying though that did did they appear on the Gong Show? Is I Blackie believe so. Lock? I mean, I don't know I if be- they made the cut. I think so. Oh my yes. god! I guess if you, we dug for it on YouTube, everyone you find Sister on on the Gong Show. Everyone listening to this now, you need to look up Sister Blackie Lawless Gong Show, and let's pray that someone. Let's see, I mean, I don't know on YouTube. God, I hope that's on there. Cause I'm a big, I, I don't, don't even remember ever seeing it myself. And I think that would have stuck in my head. <laughs> I don't but, know if you guys heard this, but wasp just announced and by wasp, I mean, blackie lawless and a bunch of cold distant outsiders right? <laughs> um, have announced they're doing a tour in 2022 where they're going to recreate the first wasp tour with the full, the torture rack, the blood oh. and gun the executioner's mask, the throwing out of the meat, basically. And I, and by the way, I don't, Bruce, you know, Bruce worked at green world, which was the original distributor of the, no, that was Peter Hewer. Oh, Peter, I, but, I worked at new image and no, my new first image, yeah, yeah. client was wasp when they did the blood drive at the Troubadour. Right. So that. new image was the publicity company that handled a bunch of the bands on green world and enigma at that time. So at that time you had like, wasp and uh who was the thor. other yeah, thor and all these early Ingve, I odin yeah, odin Ingve, oh, and wow. and bruce was the publicist for all of these early early so like the awesome. famous wasp la blood drive at the troubadour yeah and there's video footage of this on youtube and they literally it's like the bloodiest show like in la fucking metal history it's so <laughs> awesome please look it up they literally are just throwing meat in the crowd and pouring blood <laughs> it's the greatest it's the greatest thing ever oh and, my gosh I mean, as a youth, I was just obsessed with like shock metal and plasmatics and wasp and, you know, Odin and Carrie doll and Lizzie Borden, oh, yeah. Singh, anything just fucking like bonsai crazy. And then when I got to know Bruce, it turns out he was the publicist for all of these bands. <laughs> it was meant to be. It was meant to be. Oh my gosh. Well, actually I'll tell you a quick story yeah. that um, Bruce and I, uh, we became friends because Alive Records, who essentially signed us for our first deal, which was an offshoot of Bump, hated us so much that they threw us off the label. And literally in a fit, this is the street walking cheetahs, in a fit of, oh, just you guys suck so bad. They were like, I go, well, yeah, well, then if you're going to throw us off, who else are we going to call? They go, hey, why, don't, why don't you call Bruce Duff at Triple X? He, he must be into your type of bullshit. And I was like, actually, I, Bruce Duff is a reputable rock and roll guy. I might call him up. So I did call up Bruce Duff, and I, I introduced myself. It's Frank Meyer from the Street Walking Cheetahs, and he said he had seen us. Um, and we ended up, you know, becoming pals and stuff. So, but, but literally that's how we formed. It was just like complete, you know, d- but, but so, and then <laughs> Bruce and I went out early on in our courtship of each other, right. like, Hey, should the cheetahs sign to triple X for no money? Like there was an actual courtship. There was a courtship in a deal that involved no money for anybody. <laughs> so we actually went, went out for drinks and, and we went out. And we saw Bauhaus at the Hollywood Athletic Club. Bruce, oh, nice. I don't know if you remember this. We're getting very sentimental here. And we were talking about the band Red Cross. And I was like, man, I'm such a big Red Cross fan. One of my favorite things by them is they do this great cover of Deuce by Kiss. And the solo is just so spot fucking spot on. And he goes, that's me. <laughs> What do you 
actually, I play, look at the liner notes. I play the solo on that. Wow. And sure enough, he is in the liner notes. And I guess that like they recorded the song and none of them could nail the solo and Bruce was next door. So they called him over and he was like, sure. And he knocked, you know, you tell the story, but he blasted it off in one take and that's what you hear. And, and then years wow. later I formed like 19 bands with that guy. That's that guy amazing. Well, it was, uh, Bill Bartell's record label put out the record. It was called Gasatanka. He was a big Kiss fan, so Casablanca, Gasatanka. Okay. I, did Anyways, not know th- I did not know that Bill Bartell put out Team Oh, yeah, he put out Team Bitch. So wow. um, he put it out, and he had him in the studio, and uh, he called me up one day, and he goes, and so he, Bill knew me from back when I used to do guitar lessons in Riverside. And like, it was during the age when pe- kids would come in with their kiss and Ted Nugent records and go, show me how to do this. And then, right. you know, you figure it out. So, to him. so he goes, could you play, you know, deuce by kiss? And I go, yeah. He goes, do you know it? And I go, no. So I went home <laughs> for lunch from where I, from the PR company we were just talking about. I went home for lunch and put it on this record player and played it for a while. I'm going, okay. I got the idea. Went to the session later. It was out of control. Gaze the X was producing it. I walked in. The two brothers are in the control room face to face screaming at each other. Like, I don't even know what the problem was, but they were very upset. Gaze is trying to wind things. I go, Hey, and I come in with my roommates, Les Paul and my Stratocaster. I go, Hey, I'm ready to do that. solo." I goes, okay, great. But don't play those play this. And he hands me Jeff McDonald's brand new BC rich that they got all that. <laughs> The strings are about this high off the neck, you know, and it's like <laughs> horrible. But the sound was pretty good. It was like a typical Gaza X, maximum distortion, maximum chorus, maximum echo. So it's hard to sound cruddy. So, um, so I played a couple solos. He goes, these are great. These are great. He's really encouraging. So finally it goes to, uh, I've finished the two solos. I go, okay, I'm going to go. And he goes, oh no, you can't go. I go, why? Why? He goes, the third solo, I'm going, th- and there is three solos in Deuce. I didn't even go that far into the record. Go, Who puts three guitar solos in the song? Yeah, the, ve- the very last outro one. Good Lord. So he, I go, I don't know what to do. He goes, just play as fast as you can. So so that's what I did. Wow. That was, that was the producer's instructions. <laughs> that is amazing. I'll tell you a super funny quick side, side yeah, anecdote. Yeah, please. So while I was in there, Bill who was paying for all this was in the, in the like room where the bands would play and no one was playing. Cause we were just doing overdubs messing with the machine that you would mix to like a stereo tape recorder that was in that other room. And I was like, what is Bill doing? And so I didn't really, uh, finally I left. What Bill was doing was he set up the tape recorder to record the two McDonald brothers arguing. And then he put out a cassette of it to all his friends later. <laughs> Hilarious. Oh. I, w- that's a, I wish to God I could find it. And I can't, but I did have a copy of uh, oh. the McDonald tapes. Wow. I would love to hear that. It was, it was, I'm sure it was insane because they would just argue about anything. They got over that. They eventually, you know, grew out of their Oasis phase right. and became like a team that could work together. But I think Oasis hasn't done that yet. No. Or the Black Crows. Not yet. So you guys started uh, Sweet Justice. I, like you said, kind of as, as a side project. The first album came out in 2004. That's right. And so there's, what, what's that, a 17 year, seven, eight, nine, ten, yeah, 17 I year mean, gap? It's a weird thing. I mean, basically, the way it went down is that when the Cheetahs originally broke up, Bruce and I formed Sweet Justice, and we made the album in 2004. And at the time, it was, we were trying to, you know, really do like everything that our other bands weren't doing. So the cheetahs and the ads, which was his band and my band, we were doing, you know, kind of punk rock with some glammy hard rock influences. And so with sweet justice, we were leaning into blues and jazz and Latin and a little jam reggae. Christina, wanna be yours till the end of time. Hey, Christina, wanna see ya, be with me tonight. I like the way you wrap around me, the way you hold me tight. 
Yeah, a little reggae. We were kind of little Hendrix, you know. We were kind of just trying to get away from like two and a half minute long glammy hard rock punk punk songs, and so we made that record, and eventually, Sweet Justice morphed into this sort of biker metal band called Angus Khan. And we we did two albums as Angus Khan. And really what it just was, was that like, as much as we were loving the material that we were doing with Sweet Justice, it was hard at that time in the early 2000s, like no one was doing blues rock. And we, we felt like we were like on this yeah. weird island, you know, like later on, a few years later, Gary Clark Jr. and Rival Sons and all these bands came out and sort of re that stuff. But when we were doing it, like no one gave a fuck. And we sort, sort of felt like, boy, these songs are good. And we feel like this band is happening, but it's not really landing. Yeah. And meanwhile, we would have this buddy of ours, uh, this guy, Derek Dirty D Christensen from this band, the B movie rats. He was coming in like occasionally would jump up on encores. And when we saw him fronting the band, we were like, Oh, well maybe another idea would be to put him in the band and kind of go in more of a metal direction. And we did that, but it wasn't sweet justice. I mean, it was basically just me and Bruce deciding to go in a different direction with this other singer. Okay. And we did a few records, as Angus Khan and Sweet Justice just sort of went away. And eventually Bruce ended up joining the Streetwalk and Cheetahs when the, the Cheetahs reformed. And we've spent the last, Jesus, decade now. There uh, was an interim uh, moment of Sweet Justice after Angus Khan broke up. Yeah, yeah there was. But 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 essentially, we didn't yeah, we didn't. But no, he's right. We, we did it for a little for a little while and we wrote some more songs. Uh, and then essentially the cheetahs reformed and we did the cheetahs. And then what happened was COVID and the cheetahs had already recorded a record that was, that ended up coming out called right. one more drink. Yeah. But suddenly both Bruce and I had a lot more time on our hands than we anticipated. And even guys like us who are pretty progressive, like um, we write a lot of songs together separately in a lot of different directions, but suddenly we had a year off with nothing else to do. <laughs> and we met with some friends of ours from this label called eternal music group. And they were sort of looking for like blues rock stuff. Cause that was doing well for them. And, this guy Todrick from the label had actually been an early guy involved in sweet justice. Okay. And so Todrick was like, Hey man, you know, we're, we're looking for some blues rock stuff. And you and Bruce had all that sweet justice stuff. Why don't you guys kind of uh, do that? You know, give me some, give me some ideas in that zone. So we started coming up with some new ideas that very much felt like an extension of what we had done in sweet justice. And that ended up that that whole conversation musically and otherwise became the Red Lion EP, which is eight new songs by Sweet Justice. It's me and Bruce, but also uh, Mike Sessa from the Streetwalk and Cheetahs is on drums. And we were going back to, you know, that blues vibe that we were doing a decade or so ago. But the main difference now is that like, now that genre has reestablished itself. So it doesn't feel so weird and alien for us to be doing. And it doesn't feel like we're like totally removed from like the conversation of yeah. modern music. Yeah. Now, like you turn on the TV and you hear just hear blues rock guitar coming out of every gap ad. And yeah. this, you know, like the Jack white template has become sort of like 
you know, there's the Stones and Jack White, and that's sort of what America and the world thinks of as blues rock. Yeah. And so for guys like Bruce and I, who we've been doing this stuff in our sleep for years, we just go like, okay, like we did that a couple decades ago, and now we'll do it now. And like, you know, this, this is our take on what modern blues rock is, you know? I, Maybe let's just make sure we mention that. Uh, I just want to mention that we do have a new album out, the Red Line EP by Sweet Justice. And that's really like the thing that we've really spent a lot of time on lately. Well, I've it's done the way you like it songs. I think it, it's, it's awesome. And it's a lot to me. It sounds a lot heavier, a lot nastier than the first album. It's just yeah, it's a like, lot heavier. It's like black Sabbath blues rock. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. I mean, and you've got it, it to me, what popped into my head was like RL Burnside meets ACDC. Yes, I love you know, right. that. I, like, I that. like that. That's great comparison. It's, yeah. that's, and it's that. especially the, the first song. I mean, the, the, the EP starts off with Red Line and that song. I mean, damn it, guys. That, that thing is that song's incredible. You know, into it immediately it's funny you say acdc because really in my head what i what what bruce and i think wanted to do with that song is like we wanted to do the modern take on like a robert johnson rl burnside thing which is a very simple one two note kind of you know howlin wolf guitar riff but modernize it with that acdc vibe yeah. you know give it like some power chords and some thunder underneath Oh man, and you guys did an amazing job. And then you've got like the slow burners like like Medicine Show. song kicks ass i mean it's got this incredible warm guitar tone it to me it, it reminds me kind of like the like jimmy page's presence into the outdoor tone it's, or it's, it's really john Sykes. 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 man that, ah. that's, that, that's me and bruce basically paying our homage if you will to like that late 70s billy gibbons like johnny winter meets yeah. Easy top you know i love that vibe man i'm such a texas blues fan el Degato. Yeah. That yes. Oh, I don't know why that didn't pop into my head, but so unfortunately we are running low on time. But uh what did what are the uh plans with Sweet Justice now? Are you guys gonna be playing live? Are you gonna be opening for yourselves in the street walking cheetahs or is there uh I, I think at this point the idea with Sweet Justice is that Bruce and I are, you know, we're songwriters, man. We do this for a living, like we love writing songs. And Sweet Justice is sort of our pocket for writing like really soulful, bluesy rock songs. So I think, yes, we will play gigs. We have played gigs. There'll always be gigs. And and yeah, we'll do gigs. But I definitely feel like it's going to be a bit more of a recording thing because I just feel like that's like a sweet spot for Bruce and I, like songwriting wise. Okay, it might be premature, but the label did mention doing something with horns. Maybe taking it a bit in that direction. With porn music? Horns. Porno? No, no, horns. Oh, oh horn. <laughs> oh. I was like, yeah, yeah. I, was like I, had, I had porns. This sounds very exciting. So, <laughs> suddenly you guys get a little funky. <laughs> I hadn't heard that from the label, but I like where they're at. We've got the wall off for the porn. <laughs> Yeah, it's interesting. 2022. <laughs> wow, breaking news here on the podcast. I mean, Whoa, that's a genre that I didn't think you guys would. Damn, I, I didn't foresee no. that one. I, 
I'm in the band and I didn't see that coming. <laughs> maybe that's, maybe coming. that's the cross reference. We do porn with horns. <laughs> oh, Jesus. <laughs> Holy macaroni. I love it. Oh, man. Because. I really appreciate this. I got to get you guys back on. We got to have a little bit longer conversation because this went by way too fast. Yeah, dude, let's do part two because I feel like we just told you old war stories. Now let's get into some new shit. We got, we got some, we got some stories for you, baby. I know it, it's, uh, I, cause I, I saw some videos with you and Cherie. You guys playing. Oh some- yeah. Oh, very much so. That we, was that some- very legendary rock experiences, Bruce and I. I would love to hear more. I would. Let's do. Let's do part two, baby. Awesome. Well, guys, before we let you go, um, one more time. What are the social medias? How can people order the album and and get your music? You can go to order the Sweet Justice Redline EP. You can go to Eternal Music Group. And that's where you can purchase it, but it's available widely through all digital platforms. So you can go to, you know, wherever you buy digital music and score it there. And then sweet justice, mainly you can catch us on Instagram where it's sweet justice underscore music, but we're also on Facebook as sweet justice and uh, come look us up. It's myself and Bruce Duff and street walking cheetahs drummer, Mike Sessa, who's just a beast. He's all over this record. Awesome. And uh, Bruce, 30 seconds, Bruce. You got anything? Oh, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty much uh, all in. Uh, yeah, you know, it'd be fun to come back on and uh, pull a few records out of the rack from both of us and just maybe go through, through some old, obscure uh, Absolutely. tracks that might be fun to, like, alert people to. Absolutely. Oh, yeah, man. Yeah. And stuff not so old. I like it. We'll do it. 